Welcome back to another podcast episode where we help aspiring developers get jobs and junior developers grow. We are going to be reviewing Tech Elevator today. I invited three graduates on and we're going to get their real experiences, get past that marketing that we often get from coding boot camps and hear their real stories. So like usual, we'll go ahead and start with our intros. Start with you, Greg. Uh, so when did you graduate? Um, why do I always forget these questions as soon as I start? When did you graduate? Are you still looking for a job or did you find one? And what was your old industry? Yeah, so I, I graduated in around December of this last year. So I think I was the second um, remote uh, Columbus-based boot camp. Um, yeah, so, and I did find a job right out of Tech Elevator. Um, although I kind of took the first job that I was offered which I had a kind of a bad gut feeling about, which I can say to new developers, if you have a bad gut feeling <laughs> about a job, um, if you don't mind me telling a story real quick of, of how that job worked out, it was, sure. uh, it was an educational service center um, for a county in Southeast Ohio. And it sounded really cool on the surface where you know, you're managing data for all these students and you're building applications to help them have resources for the educators in those counties. Um, but I was replacing a guy that had been there for 17 years. There was no boss. I mean, my boss was a guy that didn't know how to code. Um, he left me no notes. There was no version control system. That's something you really want to ask for. <laughs> um, and, you know, and they told me that he would be there to train me. But actually, the first day I started was his first day of retirement. So he had 90 days where he was not allowed to correspond with me at all. Um, and so you might, you might guess that this was a difficult thing. Um, you know, and I ended up, you know, I ended up sticking out, you know, the length of the first contract that I signed, which was ending, you know, a few weeks ago. So I just ended that job a few weeks ago. Um, you know, it was really tough. I put in all the extra hours that one would need to, um, it was in a language I didn't know, which was vb.net was a little bit. Um, a little bit different than C sharp um, is a little bit more awkward in the syntax and everything. Um, but, you know, I, I you know, and, and I felt like I was doing a lot of repetitive tasks that could have been automated had I had a senior developer to work with that could have helped me, you know, figure out how to automate stuff. And there were some issues with the security um, of private student data that I was uncomfortable with. And I didn't really want to stay in that position because I didn't have the background and building security networks for them. Um, and so, you know, as I left, I tried to leave them a list of things of what they were really looking for because they hadn't hired another person in this area for over 10 years. Um, yeah, and, and the industry that I was in before is I was doing software implementation. So I was managing projects for a company that taught, that made a video game that te teaches people how to have difficult conversations with students or with um, student vets, or with, you know, we, we taught LGBTQ cultural competency for um, middle school and high school teachers and stuff like that. I was also doing customer success. Um, yeah. Okay, really cool. I appreciate you elaborating with that story. I'm sure future employers are gonna enjoy hearing that as well and appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, actually, there was one project they asked me to do where I, I called a friend over who's a you know, a 10-year veteran, has worked at Facebook, done all the things, and he, he helped me the whole night because he said it was like looking at a train wreck. <laughs> he said it was, uh, it's kind of like, it's like the monster that you hear about that exists somewhere out in the developer world. He said, I got to explore that monster with you, and it was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Felt bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, how about you, Tim? Awesome. Uh, I'm Tim. I graduated Tech Elevator in April of 2020. Um, we were that cohort that was in that transition from in-person to remote. Um, in terms of position, uh, immediately afterwards, I do uh, software, uh, QA, and work uh, in the RPA field for PNC. Um, and in terms of background, uh, I went to college for computer science and stuff like that. 
um, and just didn't really enjoy spending all that money and you know researching so many different topics that i may not be that interested in because what i loved was development and uh that sort of environment uh so what i did was uh left college i uh, got my scrum master two uh really early into my career and went to tech elevator because it sounded like a great way to uh, boost my career really cool how far were you into the cs degree so I would have been second year. So okay. just starting some of those courses on it. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Sounds good. How about you, Noel? Yeah, I'm Noel Rivera. I also graduated in April of 2020. Um, I got a job in July of that year. So I went through a few interviews and then ended up uh, working as a front end software engineer on the Kroger design system. Um, so that was a really fortuitous um, interview that I had with them. Um, prior to that, I was in book publishing. I was a managing editor for a local Cincinnati publisher um, that unfortunately had uh, gone under the year before. So I was already unemployed by the time um, things started getting strange um, and shutting down. But uh, I decided to go into you know development because I had already sort of been looking into that before my company even announced that they were going bankrupt. Um, and I was realizing that it was something that I sort of missed out on growing up um, in the 80s when it was really just getting started and no one was really talking about it in my school at least. So uh, I was getting into it because I've been to animation school and I did graphic design and in doing that, I had done some CSS and HTML sort of stuff, really basic. Um, so I thought, well, okay, well, maybe I'll just dive a little bit deeper and see what it's like and found that I really enjoyed it. And that was what drove me to join the boot camp. Okay. Very cool. Do you, um, you mentioned you had a position, right? Yes. And what was the actual title of the position? Or like, do you focus more on front end or back end is what I want to know. Oh, my team focuses more on front end. Okay. Do you feel like you being design savvy helped you get that role? I think it did. Yes. Um, I think my sort of unusual background in animation, graphic design and publishing. So documentation effectively really sort of laid the groundwork for that. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So why do you guys choose tech elevator? And this is the part where we get to talk over each other. <laughs> Um, I'll jump in just because I get asked that uh, pretty often. Um, so it was recommended to me by a friend who gave me a reference for someone who had been there. So I talked to him and I went to an event and it's, I think, one of the two local Cincinnati schools. And I definitely wanted something I could go to in person at the time because that just helps me focus, you know, better. Um, and when I was listening to them, one of the things that really stood out to me, in addition to them covering all of the full stack items I was interested in learning, was their career placement and career development work. Um, because I've been to schools, you know, colleges and things, and sort of like, congratulations, you've graduated, you're done now, goodbye. And I'm like, okay, but now what? <laughs> Um, so it really mattered to me that they cared about placing us in roles and helping us make contacts and network. And so I decided that that was something that I liked about that school and picked them. Okay. Uh, for me, it was a very similar situation. Um, I had heard about them when I was still in high school because um, it just popped up on uh, LinkedIn. Um, so heard about it, then went to college, came back and was kind of looking for to pursue some options. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember them. So I went ahead and attended an open house and I uh, found out a lot about their pathway program. So the job placement. And that's what got me hooked was the networking and the uh, the strength of their program of finding you a position and some of those skills that go along with it. Yeah, they are um, still one of the programs. Do they call themselves a coding boot camp? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They are one of the coding boot camps that uh, remained on sir.org and still report to them, which I like to see. A lot of coding boot camps backed out of that in 2020. Um, didn't really want to share that data. So it was interesting doing some research. Um, I can't, one thing I can do is give them credit where credit is due. A lot of their data seems to match what they're advertising. That might be due to the pathway program, but we'll dive into that later. 
Okay. Sure. Um, the reason that I chose it, um, I am a skeptic and Me they too. seem the least suspect. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, when I did my research and, and I thought, okay, well, here's all these options. Okay. Look at this, look at this, look at this. Well, then I realized, you know, I really want to stay. I really didn't want to move out of Columbus because I have, um, you know, some of my best friends live here. I just got, I lived in New York for six years before I moved back to Columbus. Um, I was having a lot of trouble finding a job in my previous work. You know, there's not a lot of software implementation specialist positions in Columbus, Ohio. Um, so I felt very pigeonholed with that niche and, you know, and gosh, it was coronavirus hit. And I thought, you know, I need to learn a new skill. I don't really, I need to do something because I can't just sit around and collect unemployment because I'm just not that kind of person. And after doing research on all these different places, it was like, well, this one actually seems integrated into the Columbus community of software. Like it looks like they're, it looks like they care about the local community. It looks like, and you know, and they didn't seem to make, they didn't seem to make any major promises that sounded like BS marketing language. Of course they have the marketing language, but when you really dig deep into what is being presented, like I never felt any bad feelings about what was being said or what was being done. So I just kind of, yeah, went through. Okay. Very cool. And for extra context, um, I chose to bring on people that graduated with the uh, .NET program specifically. I think they also have a Java program, right? That's okay. right. So we're going to be focusing on that. But what did you learn? Okay. Uh, so for me, uh, a lot of what I was learning was some more of the server side uh, information and security. Uh, they walked us through pretty much a pretty good like dipping your toe into a lot of subjects. Um, and for me, some of those later ones were the more important ones. Uh, granted, having the background in is a little bit different. So they did a I feel a pretty good job for those who were kind of coming into this blind or like this was their first foray into it because I had a decent amount of uh, individuals who are doing a complete career change in my class and from the sound of it the sort of beginning steps were pretty good but it was kind of hurried along to get to some of the further uh, later information and so once you got there though uh, it was it was some good um, dive so at least it's when you're looking for your positions or if you want to claim like oh I'm full stack what does that truly take? You know, did you like all of the subjects we covered? And um, yeah, they just kind of covered a bevy of subjects. Yeah, and so, and then I can, I can kind of lay out kind of the order of how the, the classes went, you know. The first few weeks there, we were learning basic C-sharp, um, you know, um, and then we, we learned how to make a, pro, a command line program. You know, um, I think my first capstone was building a virtual vending machine. Um, and then, you know, the next step, they took us through APIs. Or no, no, wait, 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 wait. Next step was SQL. Um, they, they taught us SQL. Um, and we used MySQL server. Um, and that kind of, you know, that linked into C Sharp. And then they taught us APIs. Um, and then after that is where actually all of the programs do the same thing, where they go into JavaScript, they go into Vue.js, um, which is similar to React or Angular. I think I hear it's a little bit more simple than those. Um, but yeah, at the end of each of those little segments, you have a capstone that you build together, um, usually, you know, team coding with somebody. And yeah, I mean, I would say I came into it only knowing SQL beforehand. Um, and I only knew SQL through like another system anyway. Um, and I would say it was the best learning environment I've ever been in. Um, because it forced you to know stuff. <laughs> if you didn't, if you didn't pay attention for two days, you're you're dead. <laughs> um, to be to be for to be forward with it, you know, you could not slack off. Um, and that was something I, I had a lot of. That's kind of what I struggled with when I was in college, um, because um, you know I was I never really learned how to study um, growing up in high school because I was valedictorian and I, I didn't have to go out of my way to be that. <laughs> So when I got to this coding boot camp, it was like, oh my God, every single night, I really do have to put in my three or four hours. 
and there were people are ava- available for me to talk to. Um, and my, my, my co stu- my students, my cohorts were the best co students that I've ever had in my life. I've, I'm still friends with many of them today. It's good to hear. Anything you'd add or change, Noel, with your experience? No, uh, Greg laid it out exactly the way I was going to lay it out. <laughs> um, yeah, that exactly the same. I think the only thing that was a little bit odd for those of us who graduated in April 2020 was that we spent half of our time in class and then suddenly we had to go virtual all of a sudden. So it was a big turnaround, but they did a really awesome job of keeping everybody um, together. And, you know, we would all stay online and work together through the projects and problems and things like that. So uh, it was really really well handled despite the sudden change and, and I'll, 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 oh sorry go ahead, go ahead. um no go oh, ahead I was, greg then i was just gonna say i have to give extra kudos to this guy matt eland who was my main professor um main instructor for my class he was available every day until 6 30 p.m and he would have dinner with his wife and then he would be available from 9 p.m to like 11 30 p.m after that um, if you wanted to poke him, occasionally he'd be playing games at two in the morning and he would still respond and just tell you he's tired. And you could you could show up to class 30 minutes early and have discussions about the homework with other students. I mean, you I've never really felt so much individual care placed um, on, on a learning environment, um, at least when it comes to the uh, coding material. OK. What were some of the challenges that you faced when switching to remote where they might have struggled to just transfer that over? So I was all remote, so that's you too. Yeah. Uh, so for us, uh, that the struggles with that were uh, just the shift in uh, before there was a lot more interactivity with being in person learning the material versus just staring at a screen for three hours and then go off and do your homework. Um, we had a lot of problems with learning the, uh, the application that we were using. So using the breakout rooms efficiently or, okay, you use your half an hour of free time. Now I'll use mine and setting that up. Uh, and we... Uh, we switched during some of the harder content or like when it's more individual. So that was when we were learning uh, Vue.js and then would have gone into our final capstone, which is the building your application with your team. So we had really good experience then at that point, uh, coordinating and working remote because, I mean, it was up to us normally to get this project done. And then it was also built on top of that, how to manage your project correctly while being remote and uh sort of allocating your assets as necessary and just doing a really good job of planning and communication and just really enforcing some of those skills that have become really vital uh, to use for work every day now. Okay, so it, I remember you also mentioning that there was kind of a, a leap that your cohort made from easier material into much harder material. Mm -hmm. Uh, Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Like what were some of the struggles of the cohort with that? Yeah, so that would be the transition from where we're all uh, doing our C-sharp work to where we were meeting, linking up with the sort of Java class and we're all doing JavaScript. So for those of the cohort who didn't have much experience in JavaScript, that was yet another uh, thing to be learning on top of whatever else it was you were already doing and doing your remote work. So there was a lot of, uh, hey, can you stay after and discuss this and whatever else. So there was a lot of extra learning baked into the uh, material then at that time once you we shifted over. Do you feel like you were able to pick a lot of that up within the time span of like the actual business hours of like nine to five? Or did you feel like to be able to compensate for that you had to put in three four extra hours a night 
I would say with personal experience, I was able to do it within the hours of nine to five, maybe with like a YouTube video here or there in the evening while I'm like eating dinner and being like, okay, yeah, you know, refresher. But for the most part, the content was digestible within that time frame. It's just sometimes within that time frame, you were allocating towards actually working on your project and then you might have to shoot a question afterwards because you're like, oh, I was so, you know, dialed into what it was I was doing. I forgot to ask my, uh, you know, buddy like hey what's what's going on with this so um i think it is digestible within that amount of time but i also feel like it kind of comes from your comfort level with the material uh, what what did it take to get in what was the interview process like we took a short uh sort of pre-test online uh, and if you pass that they would call you in for an interview and an additional longer test um, I don't exactly know what the criteria, like the rules were on their end of things to like make the decision whether or not to call you to admit you or not, but it did require like a sort of a logic test and, an, and a personal interview so they could get a sense of who you were and why you were doing it. And the yeah. logic test didn't require any syntax knowledge? No, no, it was all general sort of um, problems. It was not code specific. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't tell me which question I got wrong on the longer tests, and I'm still mad at them for that slide. That's okay. <laughs> that's, okay. <laughs> um, that's funny, though. Okay. Do you feel like, so it sounds like all three of you might have had a, a decent experience. Um, do you feel like there were other people in your cohort that might have gotten accepted that might not have been prepared for that leap? for the fast pace that, you know, especially when you joined the .NET stack and the Java stack, do you feel like that interview test weeded people out to make sure they were ready? Now, so, so our, and I remember in our class specifically, cause we had two Java groups and one C sharp group. And out of the Java group, there were some people in Java that ended up not finishing. Um, I don't think it was more than three total. And I think there were, you know, 40 people or, you know, close to 40 people taking Java classes in total. I know that every single person from C Sharp that started C Sharp in my cohort graduated. Um, and I mean, and that includes, you know, I had one, I had one guy I was working with. Um, he knows four other languages, like human languages. Um, English is his fifth best language. And he was able to learn C Sharp. Um, with English as his fifth best language. And, you know, he and I worked on one of our capstones together and there were little bits of, you know, communication issues English wise with him. But when we really, really stuck it out together, I mean, the guy was grasping the material. And I um, really think that, you know, uh, yeah, I think they did a really great job of kind of parsing out who should have been there and who shouldn't have been there. Um, I, I was really, really happy with the C sharp class I was in. Okay. I would I would mirror that and say that from what I recall of everyone who was admitted into our class in Java and C Sharp, I think two people left and they both left within the first week. So they didn't like drag it out and then not graduate. Everyone who stayed graduated. I'm not sure exactly if everyone got placement because I didn't keep up with everyone, but um, but they did all graduate. Okay. Yeah, uh, similar experience. Um, I feel like most, yeah, we only had a few people drop out for various reasons. Uh, a couple people even switched within, like I moved from uh, C to Java or Java to vice versa. Um, and I definitely feel like some of the testing and their uh, guidelines for how we accept people aren't necessarily just on technical aptitude, but it's also almost like a perseverance thing, because there was definitely uh, some cohort members where necessarily like their coding was, it was okay, it was it was enough to get them through the course, but their vigor for wanting to learn it and be better or ask those questions and uh, really strive to do this is what kept them there and kept them going and uh, got them in in the first place. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think maybe, and you know, when you, when you asked us, you know, what did you learn? I think maybe beyond the specifics of what I laid out of the pieces of the cohorts and what you do, they were teaching you how to teach yourself how to code as well. So, you know, um, you know, one of my 
as soon as as soon as the cohort was over, one of my classmates, William, he got a Python. He got a Python certification in four weeks. Um, you know, that was like, you know, it kind of he had an insatiable appetite to keep going. Um, and I think that was really the most valuable thing um, that that they really taught us, which is how to teach yourself how to code. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I might um, I might take their aptitude test. I saw that listed, and I'm kind of curious what questions they ask. So I might do that. It's not going to be tonight, but sometime in the near future. So I'm going to take a look at that. That's interesting, because very often coding boot camps that uh, a lot of coding boot camps aren't great at testing aptitude, testing soft skills, testing uh, traits in you, like perseverance and, and what that looks like and how to test for that. Like a lot of coding boot camps, in my opinion, don't do a good job of testing for that in general. And they do a pretty good job of like you can, a lot of coding boot camps will measure it based on, you know, like, okay, you know nothing right now, we're gonna give you some material and see how you learn it. And you know, often it's gonna be challenging to them and they wanna see like how will they pick it up on their own? Do they actually put the effort into learning something on their own? Um, and uh, th they'll test for like, you know, do I wanna code with this person? How well, or how good of a job do they do at explaining this problem to me, explaining the solution? Do they, do they panic, do they freeze up, or do they at least ask questions or like try to go to the next step without saying, oh, I give up, I, I don't know what to do, you know? Like a lot of coding boot camps will look at different things. Um, and I guess it's a long-winded response of saying, I wanna look at their aptitude test. Mm -hmm. Sounds interesting. Um, if I may add a, a little personal experience there, um, I, I can totally see what you mean from just how, how do they test that, and I would say that big part of it really was our uh, in-person interview uh, for going in with that. Because uh, I specifically remember um, I had myself uh, all dressed up nice, I had my binder with like, you know, my pen, my paper, my resume, I was ready to go. And I walk in that door and you could tell they were, they were excited that I was ready to go with some of those soft skills, right? And so it was kind of a, how do you conduct yourself when we're having this? And how do you answer? And I remember towards the end of it, I was being told like, oh yeah, we can we can get you to a company if you learn the skills that we can teach you we can we can sort of market you so uh, I think that some of their uh, testing I mean the, whether or not you're good at recognizing patterns is part of it but it's also uh, can can we really work with you I think is, yeah. is what's yeah, a big part I, of it I think I think I might agree with you Tim where I think the I mean I did a video interview because post coronavirus but I think that was probably the most important thing to them um, because, you know, I even remember being told, you know, they kept notes on me because of that interview um, and issues that I might have getting a job based off of how that interview went, yeah. um, which is, you know, due to my, uh, you know, I have an outgoing personality. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, I, 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 I guess they, they said I could be off putting or something um, to some people. Um, and yeah, those, those, those notes from that initial interview, they were kept and they, the people in the pathway program, they were already ready to try to help talk me through some of those things. Um, and so I think, you know, they, they were pretty open with me about both the positive and negatives um, as to, you know, why they might bring me on. Okay. I think you have a very likable personality from what I've seen so far, by the way, Greg. Um, Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Let's jump into it. Um, I got a few more questions because I really want to, what I try to do, so I'm actually just going to say it. Uh, what I have been doing is I did this with She Codes and I'm doing this uh, with Tech Elevator and uh, future coding bootcamp episodes, but I'm trying to get people basically like, ask uh, your rating and I dig into that a little bit, um, especially if I have future questions. Um, so I try to get like balance ratings um, and I try to really average that rating to about three and um, out of five. And I think all three of you had slightly higher ratings. So I want to really challenge you and I want you to think about this as we go through the next few questions. Think about what they can improve try to be critical because i know you know overall it sounds like you had pretty good experiences so see if you can come up with a few things um but 
just think about that in the background. But for now, I kind of want to get a feel for like how much attention did you get? How much uh, did you feel supported throughout the program? Um, and what I like to first ask is like, how big was your cohort size and how many teachers did you have for each cohort? My cohort was, I don't even remember the number of students, but it was a small number, like not more than like 13, I think. And it's two teachers and one assistant teacher. So one for C sharp, one for Java, and then like an assistant teacher who goes between the two. Um, and each class had approximately the same. So I would estimate around 13 each. So it was a really manageable class size for the instructors. Um, I would say I felt pretty supported throughout the whole thing. They were always willing to answer questions and I had a lot of support from my um, cohort itself. Uh, I think I could have used just a little bit more, I hate to say the word handholding, but I'm going to say the word handholding <laughs> um, through, through certain parts of it. There was a point where I was like cresting over um, like panic uh, one time and my instructor had to talk me down off that cliff but um that was you know in the middle of the cohort when everything's getting very real and uh intense so but even the fact that she did that that she was willing to have a long conversation with me just to help me chill out and realize i know what to do i just have to stop and break it down a little more uh was important to me you know because it showed that it mattered to her that i got through it okay if they did give you a little extra support what would that look like compared to what you experienced? I think, and then this is a issue. So I come from a very visual and word centric um, background. And so the, word, the, the types of words people use to explain something to me matters. And I think very much in the way that math teachers could never explain things to me in the way that I could understand, even though I made great math grades, um, it was a similar situation where they're explaining something to me and I'm like, you are using too much jargon. I need you to explain it a completely different way because I'm not getting it the way you're explaining it. So, you know, I'll ask now the same questions of like three or four developers on my team because I need to hear how every person explains it because everyone explains it differently. So I think that's what I would have wanted was for them to sort of like reword some things here and there so that I could grasp it a little bit better. Did you specifically ask them to reword it again? I probably didn't, okay. <laughs> I'll be honest. So it's like one of those things where you kind of have a little bit of hero worship for your instructor because sure. they're so smart. The people we have there were so bright that it was just like, uh, I had to think about how to talk to them sometimes. Like by the end of it, it was way more like chill, but yeah. <laughs> initially I didn't know how to ask. And as you go, you learn how to ask those questions, so. sure. That's pretty normal. I experienced that as well. <laughs> so I think when I when I was there for every single one of the classes, there was a main professor and an assistant professor um, and um, and the assistant professor for RC Sharp class. Uh, they were the lead professor during the sequel sections. And then the, the Matt Eland was the main professor for the rest of the time. Um, you know, the you know, I would say maybe my only thoughts of improvements come more towards the pathway stuff. But I think that that the pathway, which is like the job hunting aspect, but I think that kind of also has to do with my personality when it comes to learning coding. I, I think that maybe a way that could be improved is to further encourage students to interact with each other, because I found that when I was having issues, I would reach out to one of my cohorts that I knew had more of a background in code than I did. And we would sit there and he was kind of a sadist and he would ask you just like me, he would ask you like mean questions that he's, you're like, you're, you're no, the answer to this, you know, the answer to this, Greg, come on, you know this. And, and it would really force me to barrel through and these, you know, kind of, uh, <laughs> I really liked watching him enjoy my, my pain of struggling through stuff. It was very fun. Um, and I, I really felt like I could ask, but I really felt like I could ask any question at any time. If I have the videos still saved from all those classes, I asked five times more questions than anybody did. 
Um, and you know, they, they would tell me that that was an asset to the class because there are students that are afraid to ask those questions. Um, and so I think it just helps for there to be people in the class that are willing to ask questions that aren't afraid to look silly. Um, and that aren't afraid to ask their cohorts for help. Um, and I think, you know, just further encouraging that would just continue to help people build off of each other. Cause really that support network was invaluable. I like that you ask questions and you're right. Every cohort needs that person or two or three people. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you, you're paying. I'm glad that you ask tons of questions after each, you know, potential new topic that you learned. Um, awesome. And you said your cohort size was about 40 people. Um, oh, no, no, I was saying there were how many probably like 40 taking the Java class. So there's about 18 to 20 in each cohort. I think, I think gotcha. my cohort of C sharp was 18. Um, yeah, I think it was 18 people. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, so my cohort size, I want to say would have been 23, 22, 23. If I'm remembering that number, it has been a year. Um, and I would say in terms of support, I had a, kind of a almost opposite experience uh, that uh, Greg had, where we had a lot of different kind of uh, professors teaching different content. At one point, it was uh, Matt when he was sort of uh, stepping up towards that. Um, and for us, uh, a lot of times, uh, when people would ask questions, they apparently would come back with a uh, We'll ask you. We'll ask some of the other students. Um, and for me, I would have been that guy Greg was hanging out with, who would be like, "I know you got this, man. Like you're almost there. It's on the tip of your tongue." So a lot of my uh, a lot of my fellows, they they would ask each other, and we did a pretty good job of having a little community of just like working with each other, or like people knew, "Hey, if I show show up 15 minutes early, there's going to be a couple of people in there that I can ask stuff to, or there's a couple of people who are going to be here a little bit later because that's just the time it takes them. So if we want to work together, you can." Um, we definitely had a pretty good support network. Uh, it was there for you to use it um, if you had the chance. Uh, I would say. The only thing, like, improvement-wise is just sort of the dynamic of, at least uh, in a context or two, they wanted you to ask for help, but then when you would go for that help, there was a lot of people who were reporting, like, okay, so I come to you for help because I'm confused, and you tell me, okay, well, go back and try it again, or just ask somebody else, and it's not counterintuitive, it's just kind of passing it to, oh, keep working with your, you know, your cohort, but at a certain point, they also need to work on what they're doing versus just fielding those those questions. And Tim, we might we might have had different experiences just because I can say to anyone watching this, thinking about being at Tech Elevator, whether it's Java or C Sharp, whatever class Matt Eland is teaching, just go to that class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no he's joke. Great. No joke. That man is that man is a a uh, yeah that that man is the best. He's I, an awesome resource. I would fight. I would fight for that man if there was a war and he was on. You know, if he was some sort of general. I don't know what we're fighting for, but I'm backing him. Um, and yeah, if you can, if you can get into Matt Elon's classroom, because I mean, that guy, that guy almost never told me to go talk to somebody else. I mean, that guy, you know, unless he knew that I knew that I could do it, um, which I think is a really, that's a really tough thing to balance as a teacher. Um, and Tim, it sounds like, you know, you guys, you guys had, you know, varying professors all teaching these different things constantly. And, but when you have it kind of like how I had it, where I had this long-term relationship that I got to develop over 14 weeks with one guy and his assistant, John, um, you know, I, you know, we really got to know each other and he got to be able to really understand the balance of when to really help me and when to go tell me to figure it out. Um, and, and I think that that's, you know, that's the thing that's really hard to find in an educator almost anywhere. And so, Tim, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it sounds like people would love to be taught by Matt. That would be ideal. That'd be perfect. But not everyone is going to. And there are multiple instructors. So, I mean, I can guarantee you coding boot camps watch these episodes and hopefully they do 
take that feedback seriously. And Matt can be a shining example. And I hope they, they probably already do, but I hope they use him to illustrate, you know, kind of the ideal instructor. He might have flaws and not, you know, don't, don't follow him blindly, but um, still, like, that's really good feedback for them. So what would you, if someone was, let's say they're not getting taught by Matt, and they have gone to the instructor, they struggled. So I would argue like if you're struggling for 30, 45 minutes on an issue and you're not moving anywhere, that's a really good opportunity. You know, like you said, other students are working on other things. You can't keep going to other students. That's a good opportunity for the teacher to step forward, give them an unblocker so they can move forward. They don't have to give them the answer, but just something. Um, what advice would you give students that experienced your situation and still felt stuck? I would say they actually told us if you're stuck on it for 15, 20 minutes, come, come see us and we'll, you know, see if we can get you to the next thing. Um, so I would just say, don't be afraid. Cause I think some of us would just be like real stubborn about it sometimes and keep going despite the fact that we should probably just go into the instructor. But I would say, just go to the instructor. <laughs> I know that sounds so simple and some of us were initially sort of like nervous to talk to them and some of us, like I said, would be stubborn, but um, I think at the end of the day, they know what they're talking about. They know that's the amount of time that you should wait to keep working on it and just don't overdo it because then you're wasting your time a little bit when they're there as a resource for you. Um, so just, you know, don't be too stubborn about it. There there were a couple instances, you know, my, my other professor, John Fulton, um, where, you know, um, making sure to raise your hand and ask these questions uh, during class and then try, you know, trying to get feedback from all those other students that are currently in that class. Well, how many more of you are still having trouble understanding this? There were a couple of instances where there are four or five of us that are just going, hey, we're confused. Um, and, you know, after class, you know, staying in the same room together and kind of going over that thing with the professor um, you know, that, that sometimes, uh, that did happen a couple of times. And I think that's, I think that's, that's like a really good resource is to kind of, and then, you know, we all have this group slack, so you could kind of just go in and ask, Hey, is a, are a bunch of other people struggling with this one thing? Um, and, you know, kind of collectively ask for an additional class meet, um, for, for those struggling. Okay. I think that's pretty good feedback. Um, all right, let's move on. How well do you feel like you were prepared for a professional developer position when you graduated? Uh, in my experience, I felt I was really prepared in not necessarily content, but in sort of the, again, soft skills of how am I going to overcome my tasks? How am I going to ask people for help? How, how do I self-teach myself something new? Uh, sort of that adaptability and just some of those self-teaching methods and problem solving and time management. Time management as well, a big one. Um, and just in terms of my professional career, the content wasn't as much the important part as was the uh, way in which I was learning or handling the issues as they come up. What, what does content mean? So I would say like, I haven't needed to use things like uh, Vue.js or uh, some of the more front end things. Uh, and so that lesson was important for me to learn. I just haven't necessarily needed to use those exact examples. So I guess as a good example, I didn't use Vue.js for my work, but instead when I was learning uh, like Cucumber, I'm like, okay, this is similar and whatever else. And how did I go about learning some of that to use now? Do you feel like do you feel like it was uh, stronger on the back end? The program itself? I would say so, yes. Would you I'll add Go oh ahead. sorry. I'll add that I think after because Tim, you graduated the same month and year. Yeah. I think the cohorts that followed us got a little bit more JavaScript a little longer instead of mm -hmm. doing uh, what's it called the mvc was that the yeah yeah 
instead of doing that, they did more JavaScript, which um, I'm a little jealous about because that's what I use the most at my work. And so right. I had a, a little less of that. Um, so I say, I don't know, uh, Greg, your experience with how much more JavaScript you got, but. Yeah, we, we did. We still did MVC uh, and APIs and stuff. Um, but we, we definitely, I think we spent like enough time on JavaScript um, personally. Um, however, like, you know, and, and what I was saying, you know, being prepared for a job, I, I was not prepared for the job that I took. You all heard the story. <laughs> um, how, however, um, you know, and now, and now because I was trapped in that cycle of learning this VB.net, which almost nobody uses, um, and dealing with data systems that were not, did not have much integrity in how they were put together. Um, I am personally struggling in finding a position now um, because I felt like I spent six months doing something that was not building up my skills to where I can find a position right now. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, um, you know, I'm having a little bit of struggle on that end. And, you know, I've, I'm, um, you know, I ended up going to, to freecodecamp.org um, to just restart my JavaScript learning, which I'm blazing through it, but um, I, I am kind of having to reteach myself JavaScript because I spent so much time away from it. And I really should have taken a lot more of the advice of code, 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 you know, keep following through. And that's something they tell you at the very end. They say the best thing for you to do is to have side projects and to keep building and to keep doing stuff, um, which, which, I, which I did on some end, but not in ways that I think prepare me for developer jobs. And, and that's something that is, is something I would really improve on with myself. Okay. How about you? I, I would say for myself, I, I think, like I said, we didn't get as much JavaScript, which is what I use at my job. So I wish we'd had a little more, I would have felt a little more prepared, but we did get some and we did do Vue and my job uses React. So while that's not the same thing, they have the same sort of structure. And so whenever they're like, go have a look at these repos, I wasn't lost. I could figure out where things were and that was important. But I think the biggest thing that it prepared me to do was to know what questions to ask to be able to get through to learn what I needed to learn to do my job. So, you know, I didn't get exactly the same information that I use at uh, Kroger, but I do know how to find out what I need in order to, to do the stories and the assignments. And I think okay. that's sort of thing Noelle is like kind of, it's like impossible to do in 14 weeks, really. Uh, <laughs> do you know what I mean? To teach, to teach everything that we could need to use in a, in a developer job. And I, I think that's kind of what's what, what part of what makes this um, an, an important thing to, to keep up on our, on our own after the coding boot camp and to, to keep expanding skills on our own after the boot camp because they did teach us really how to do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, how long did it take all of you to get a job after you graduated? Three months for me. I did several interviews. I did the matchmaking. That didn't pan anything out, but uh, at the same time, that was exactly when everyone was shutting down. So I would give a little bit of leeway for that. But I did get called by the company I work for now as a result of the Pathway people giving them a select number of names, I think, of people they thought would be a good fit for positions. And um, yeah, and so that's how I got contacted and then went the interview process and ended up getting one of the two jobs I was interviewed for. Okay. Uh, for me, it would have been about four months. Um, not too long after the program, uh, I had an interview uh, with PNC. It just was kind of a hiring freeze. So I did a lot of interviews pretty early on that did follow up eventually, which was just, <laughs> again, a little bit of leeway with the, uh, yeah, all right, the hiring freeze did happen. Yeah, I, I got my job about a month after graduating. Um, but I was in a living situation where I was living with my family for that short period of time. And it was kind of like, uh, you have to take the first job that you get or we're kicking you out. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I just took the first job that I got. Um, but there were other, other things coming through and I, you know, I, I wish I would have held out a little longer, but yeah, it took about a month. Okay. It's, is it just funny hearing 
all of you say give give a little leeway because of covid um many coding boot camp graduates were taking you know six plus months and you're coming out of here like one month three months but give them a little leeway it's just a very interesting comparison what was the like yeah um honestly what do you think of the pathway program that's what it's called right mm -hmm. yeah what do you guys think of it I personally really liked it and I appreciated the work that was put into it. They have a team dedicated to Pathway. Um, so they help you put your resume together. They review it. They have other people review it. They help you work up little sort of personal speeches, which just kind of convey the most important aspects about you. So that if you were to meet an employer at a networking event and you had to summarize yourself in a marketable way as quickly as possible, you already know what to say. Um, we did that. They brought in people from other companies and other cohorts to talk about what they're doing, what's going on in the industry, whether or not their job is hiring. They brought employers in for our matchmaking event, which is basically um, speed job interviews. So you get to talk to a lot of companies um, and they get to see you and hear, you know, hear your name and your experiences. And most importantly, post-graduation for me was that they continued to do those things. They had matchmaking post-graduation. If you didn't have a job, they continued to look for jobs for you and to let you know if people were hiring. They continued to recommend networking events, although at that point we couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> but, um, but virtual events, they would uh, you know, let you know about. They also provided sort of like extended teaching opportunities. So there were large projects that they were doing sort of um, behind the scenes that graduates, if you didn't have a job, you could participate in so you could continue to keep your skills current. Um, and they had what, not weekly meetings, but I would say bi-weekly meetings if you didn't have a job yet to make sure to talk to you, see how you were feeling and uh, see what you were working toward at that moment. So. They were very proactive and that was amazing. And they were all very kind and very helpful. Um, and that, or, and that, that was my offer, experience. They offer that support for six months after you graduate. Yeah. So, so you can, so you, you can have a job after six months. You don't get that help anymore. Um, I don't think so. Although, you know, Actually, Don, I could probably get back to you on that because now I'm, I finished a six month contract and I'm kind of still looking for work. I will, I will reach out to them again and say, Hey, can I have some help? And I'll let you know if they, if they say anything. Um, I do, I do know that, you know, Vin and, uh, uh, Vinny and Ben are, were, those were the two pathway guys doing things. They were extremely supportive, really nice. It was all a bit too optimistic for my personal taste, <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm just like a fun, I'm, I, I'm like a fun, jovial pessimist. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I'll reach out to them again and see if they're willing to, to do anything. Um, I, but I do know that, you know, at a bare minimum, you are guaranteed six months of postgraduate job assistance. Um, and, th and that, and that means literally you can meet every other week for six months after you graduate. Okay. And they, they were, they were, you know, when I was struggling with that position that I, that I had taken, they were willing to set up meetings with me even same day sometimes to, you know, I was like, guys, I, I, I'm in over my head. What do I do? You know, and they kind of, they gave me both the, this is what I would say if I was your father, this is what I would say if I was your friend, this is what I would say if I was a professional consultant helping you. Uh, try to get better in the world, and and uh, yeah, this this one this one pathway director he gave me three different opinions of where I should be trying to take myself, and it, it, it was very intelligent. I felt I felt that was a really good way to approach talking to me. <laughs> okay, it, that's that's really interesting. How about you, yeah. Tim? 
Uh, so my experience uh, would be that I think they did a really good job of just uh, keeping up with kind of how your job search is going and like really giving you like every opportunity they could. Um, I felt the pathway was at its strongest when they would do things like where we brought in old alumni to talk about their current positions and what that their real job search was like, almost like a bite-sized version of kind of what we're doing now. Uh, and they would bring them in, they'd talk, whatever else. It was a great networking service. Um, they also did a really good job of kind of letting people know about what's kind of going on in, in our area, specifically in like Columbus. Like, here are some upcoming events we highly recommend you guys go to because we know there are going to be people there. So there was uh, enough, there was a good amount of hand-holding, but they also, like, really wanted you to sell you and, like, go out there and, like, uh, just really market yourself and, like, get something you want. And I kind of appreciated both the hand-holding approach, but also giving me the tools I needed, like my elevator pitch, to really go sell myself because nobody's a better, uh, you know, supporter of myself than me. So I think that was really important of the of the pathway program. Um, and yeah, it, I could just you could feel their enthusiasm when they're like, oh, how'd that uh, interview go? And you go, I think I nailed it. They get excited with you and you could really. Oh, yeah, the the energy going on there, even if the day wasn't going great or the interview didn't go great. You're like, you know what? We'll get right back out there because I know they're going to they're going to have my back. Yeah. And I, I can add that, you know, um, because I knew, you know, I, I had had a two year job hunt before I went to tech elevator regarding my implement software implementation stuff. And so I just had this kind of attitude that there's something wrong with me. There's some reason why people don't want to take me or something. Right. And so I really reached out and I, I really tried to utilize those resources in front of me. And I think that I did five additional practice interviews with my pathway directors I did six additional technical interviews with the different instructors, both Java and C Sharp. Um, and, you know, if you are willing to press to utilize the resources in front of you, they are willing to give them to you. Um, and I felt like that was probably the strongest aspect of the Pathway program is, is that, you know, if you press, then they will respond with what you're pressing for. That's good advice. And I think that aligns with a lot of the advice that you've been giving with, I mean, I said you're paying them, you should ask, but you're saying I asked all these extra questions and like you really took advantage of everything that they had to offer. And that's, that's great. I think all students should, especially if they're struggling and a lot of students won't, they feel like they're bothering people or they feel like they should know something. And I like, overall, I think that's good advice, but I want, I want to clarify a couple of things, though, because we're uh, starting to run a little bit short of time. Um, so the cap is six months. I'm going to be blunt. That's really concerning that they give up on you after six months. Because, you know, looking at a lot of the reports, a lot of these kind of average, I guess, one is below 80% within six months where people would finally get a position. And like the percent kind of average 62, 63, um, there were um, 57% at within three months. So you still have that support, but you know, even going into six months, you're starting to panic. You're starting to get desperate for a job. You know your support is getting cut off. And now I'm starting to see that like this one, 30% of people accepted a QA position. You went to a software engineering program and 31% accept a QA position, almost 7% accepted project manager. That's the report 2020 tech elevator Cleveland. So like this, these percentages will vary a little bit, but a lot of people, like a big chunk of people are selecting all these other positions when they went to a software engineering coding bootcamp. Um, you could probably tell, like, that it's it's very possible that these people were kind of panicking to find a position and they were about to lose their help. So I would be curious, um, Greg, get back to me with that. Because like, I really want you to ask about that because that yeah, seems, really yeah, that, that seems shitty. That seems really shitty especially if they're going to be abandoning people 
at the yeah, end I of the six months. Yeah, although I'm not, I mean, just knowing what kind of people that they are, I mean, at least on the surface, um, you know, I'm not expecting them to not respond. Um, and if they don't, you know, because I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I got kind of really wrapped into a pretty unfortunate situation with my first job out of Tech Elevator. Mm -hmm. And now I'm looking for a job and, you know, it's like, you know, and you, you don't want to say anything negative in an interview about your last position, right? Um, <laughs> Cause that kind of looks bad and, you know, it's kind of weird. And, you know, I was, you know, I got into the six month contract and the six month contract is up and man, I, I really would like someone to, you know, re, re look at my resume and say, Hey, did I, did I do this right? Um, and explaining this last position did I do this. Um, and yeah, and I'll, I'll definitely, I'll definitely let you know if they respond. I mean, they might not, I, I, I don't think they'd be willing to meet with me every single two weeks for an hour. I know those guys are pretty overwhelmed with their pathway program directing as it is, but um, I mean, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I have an opt, I guess I feel optimistic, <laughs> but we'll see, we'll see how optimistic uh, it turns out to be. I'll say, I don't remember them saying six months they may have done and I may have just not remembered, but I seem to recall a couple of times where prior students said that for whatever reason, their jobs after a year just did not work out and they contacted Pathway and they helped them make some more contacts. So I don't think they're going to just leave you in the dust if you reach out. Um, yeah, but like you said, they may not like like biweekly meetings or anything like that anymore, but I don't think they're just going to disappear. Yeah. I mean, I'm still part of a Slack group um, for, you know, tech elevator alumni for my particular grad thing. And they do occasionally still post jobs in there. Um, you know, even though it's now been over six months. Um, but again, yeah, I, I will, I will give you more of a confirmation from a, for, from a one-off other than just, you know, uh, assumptions. Okay. Um, did you hear anything about the length, Tim, of the pathway finder program? So from what I understood from what they were telling us was around six months was when they would, uh, the pace would slow down. The phrasing I was told was if after those six months, you still felt you would like those meetings, we could make something work. And they definitely kind of extended the, if you need help content, like getting some resources or like, I'm happy to, you know, send you over to somebody who's maybe looking for careers. Like it may not be as hand fed as like, here's a position we think you should go for, but it's more of a, Hey, this looks like a good opportunity. If you want to take it, like, you know, it, it's somebody we know they're reputable or whatever. Um, so in terms of length, I don't think that they'll completely leave you in the dark, but it's definitely, uh, the people who are in the current pathway program are going to get first dibs on things. And if, you know, we feel it's not really a great fit for any of them, we'll, we'll send it on to whoever. Okay. So every other week, isn't that much. That's not that often. First of all, um, many coding boot camps will do it weekly, like bare minimum weekly. Um, it doesn't mean that you need to do it weekly and maybe they've uh, encountered some dependence among graduates where you're like, I need help all the time. And they're like, no, you don't just like really focus the time and energy you have into talking about very product, like a productive conversation within that short time span. And there's a strategy and it's typically pretty effective at trying to get students to be more independent and also confident when they start getting results. Um, just from other reports that I've seen, though, that's a big chunk of people going into other positions besides software engineering. Um, did any of you have experienced anything like that in your cohorts where people were trying to get positions outside of software engineering? Did you hear about anything like that? Um, I mean, I actually had one. Uh, I know there was one girl in our Java, in the Java boot camp who really, really wanted to get into a software company doing HR stuff, but she, she considered Tech Elevator as a way to boost her appearance, as a way to boost her skill set, as a way to get herself into those positions. So I know that there are some students, you know, there's a very small percentage of them that didn't plan on going into coding. They wanted to take the coding boot camp because they knew that it would make them look better at a software company. 
um, because, you know, some of those positions are so competitive that it's like, oh, well, we can't, oh, well, we'll hire this person to, you know, help in our HR department because she also knows how to code and we're a software company. Um, so I know that is a small percentage of people doing that stuff. Okay. All right. I won't, I won't talk much more about this. Um, I'd be really curious. Please get back to me and let me know if they do help For you sure. out. Um, so I've heard a lot of good things about tech elevators so far. I have. And it sounds like you had pretty decent experiences. In my experience, a lot of software engineers, when they don't have confidence or they're not getting the right support, they will go into QA saying, okay, I'm closer to being a software engineer. If I get QA, you know, maybe I can get onto the software engineering team. And in reality, that often doesn't happen. People typically hire you for QA and they train you as QA. Why would they want to transfer you over? And some people do transfer over eventually. Like you really have to spend a lot of time outside of the actual job to build up those skills and transfer over. And you have to prove that you're, you're going to provide a lot more value in this department versus QA. Um, but a lot of people will move to QA and I see an analyst as well um, when they're not finding a position because coding boot camps are expensive. You often go into debt. I got to get a job quickly. Greg, you have your situation. Other people have their own unique situations. And there's a lot of financial pressure to finally get that position. And so what can happen is sometimes like that position requires extra time. It requires a lot of your energy ramping up. You're exhausted. I don't want to come home and code. I don't want to keep searching. I finally got a job and I just want to relax, right? We're only human. We can't, we're not robots. We can't keep going. So even if they slow down, like they don't put you in the dark, but even if they're slowing down, that's really concerning that they're doing that. It feels like they're getting really cheap there and they're kind of, they're basically telling most people from what, I've, what I see with the data is, you know, you're kind of on your own and for what I've heard from you as well. Um, they might give you a little resources and stuff like that, but I find like the real value if people are really struggling, you need to offer that one-on-one. -on -one. You need to hop onto a Zoom chat. You need to like really talk through what they're going through. You can hand out resources all day, but if they're not, they don't have the right habits and they don't have the right uh, constructive day to be able to utilize those resources and get them closer and build their soft skills and have people checking even their code. Are they improving? If you don't have those checks, it's almost, you, it's almost like you're not helping them at all. That one-on-one that -on -one is like the most helpful thing that you can do. Um, so get back to me. I'm not going to dive more into that. I'd be very curious about it. Yeah, um, yeah. But the last question I want to ask is what would you improve about the program? I mean, I guess maybe for me, um, you know, I, none of the matchmaking, uh, interviews went well for me, I guess. Um, I was unable to get any feedback as to why. Um, so I guess I would have really loved something like that where, you know, the people that are doing matchmaking with tech elevator, um, you know, if they could have given negative, the negative feedback as to why they didn't want to go further with me. And so tech elevator could, you know, relay that information to me so I could further improve my interviewing skills. Cause you know, I, I heard plenty directly from the tech elevator pathway program, people like, okay, this is our one-on-one. -on -one. This is what you can improve on. Same thing with the technical interviews with my professors. Um, but I never got any direct feedback from a company as to why I was not wanted to, why, why they didn't want to further look at me. And I think that would have been probably the most valuable thing that could have been done for me. Um, just because of, you know, the, the, my history of struggling to find a job before tech elevator. Um, I, that would have been the best. Um, <laughs> okay. I agree. Yeah, it's really good advice. What else? I think for me, I would have liked occasionally, at least earlier on in the program, for the instructors to be a little more proactive about checking on us. Um, because sometimes we would all sort of stay and work together in our classroom. And the teachers would be like, come see us. We're just in here, sitting here. And I'm just like, well, why don't you come in our room and see what we're doing? Because we might just be too nervous, like, right, especially at the beginning. Like our assistant teacher, he would constantly be in 
checking on us. What are you guys doing? Do you need help? What's going on? Like, if you if you didn't go to the instructor's room, he would be there making sure you were fine. Um, I would have liked the main instructors to maybe do that if there was no one visiting them, just to be sure. But I mean, that's I guess that's just sort of a they were probably trying to encourage us to come see them to make it, you know, on us and make us proactive about asking questions. And I totally understand that. But I think initially it would have been nice to have a little more uh, check in. Okay. Um, I would think my only like really big notes would be kind of reinforcing that while you may have your current position, you may be doing like well in class, really reinforcing like learning some of those extra skills or working on something in the back burner, learning another language. Because they tell us in class, hey, just a good idea, good practice to be into, do that. Well, maybe that could be actually something that's a little bit more implemented. Um, something during my cohort that we did was uh, everybody kind of had to work on some of their presentation skills, usually by talking about a topic they like really enjoyed and stuff like that. So that was something a little bit extracurricular that had people thinking about some other things than just necessarily the coding. So maybe if we could reinforce that with, hey, while you're here learning some of this, why don't you work on some Python or whatever else? And I could look over that with you and you know we can kind of go over that. So sort of when, let's say your six months is up, and some of your resources are not as proactive, what can you do as well to continue helping yourself past just being told, be better, if that makes any sense? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and a lot of supplemental resources, the students ultimately should take advantage of what they're paying for, and they should read them. They should put that extra time. I mean, you are, it's $15,000 or whatever they charge for the coding book. That's a lot of money. You need to take that seriously. And it is ultimately on the student to do that supplemental stuff if they really want to be strong. Um, but in my experience, a lot of students won't. They should. They won't. And like you said, having it be reinforced with some sort of implementation to the curriculum, even if it's minor, even if it's uh, even just asking, hey, you know, who checked out the supplemental uh, information? Like, let's talk about it. What did you learn from it? And it might even get, you know, the rest of the class saying like, oh, wow, you know, like Tim, you know, he uh he said that he read the supplemental material. He's doing really good in class. Maybe I should do it. And just like getting that conversation flowing around that material can also show this material is actually really useful. It's helpful. It's not just extra words to keep you up and prevent you from sleeping at night. So I think that's really good advice. And and Noel, I can relate to you a lot. Um, I remember, I think a lot of people can, I remember just being, it, it was it was a stupid fear to have, but I'd be afraid to ask the teacher for, for many different reasons like throughout. And especially in the beginning, because that was the first time I visited Chicago. Well, no, I, I have in the past, but that was the first time like I was in Chicago constantly and like all new people, brand new city. It took me two and a half hours there, two and a half hours back. I'm exhausted and like don't even know where I'm at. And like I'm kind of just trying to sit there and take in as much as I can. I wasn't really thinking about being proactive. I'm just like, get through this. <laughs> this is hard enough as it is. And go ahead. Oh, I'll say. And also, you know, depending on where you're coming from, at least for me, I'm coming from a job where I was a manager. I was closer to the top than the bottom. And so to completely reorient my mindset to remind myself that it's okay for me to act like I don't know what I'm doing was something I had to like get back to, you know, it's like, you know, at my job, acting like I didn't know what I was doing was not okay at my level. But in the boot camp, it is because you don't know what you're doing. It's totally new. You're starting a completely new industry and people coming from maybe a position like where I was coming from just need to be more understanding with themselves and know that they understand that you're going through this as well. And it's not a big deal. Yeah, and we in, in my cohort, we we had a couple personalities, Noel, if I may say that sounds a lot more like you, like, you know, not wanting to speak up if you're confused and things like that. And those kinds of people, I think what helped them in the end is they generated their own community of people that would meet together after class to do homework together. Um, you definitely know, the people, did that. The people that were afraid to ask the professors, they weren't afraid to ask each other. Um, but me, of course, I'm unafraid <laughs> of looking dumb all the time. Make me stupid. Review my code. Tear me apart. I'm done. <laughs> I think that type of personality comes out with much more with a program. And I, I think that's a good lesson for people. So, you know, that's pretty much it. I think, you know, 
I'll do a really short summary. Um, it sounds like a pretty strong program, strong on the back end, um, a little bit less on the front end. Maybe they improved it. It sounds like they probably have seen a deficit in the front end, and so they're trying to focus more on JavaScript. So they're paying attention. They're probably getting student feedback. That's that's all great. Um, you know, .NET typically is going to put you in more enterprise companies, larger companies, and um, you should know that going into it. it. Doesn't mean startups don't use it, but typically that's where I see um, those stacks used. Uh, it sounds like the teachers are like caring. They're helpful. And they're supportive, um, and there are instructors that need to improve, just like any other program. Like it all sounds pretty normal and it sounds like they're, they do care about you and they want to help you. Pathway program is something that was exciting me hearing about it. It sounded pretty strong, very supportive. Um, I really do think they're dropping the ball by cutting that six months, even if it's a soft cut. Um, I hope they do can reconsider with something like that. But um, just kind of with the data that I'm seeing, but again, Greg, you're going to update me with that. And anyone else that's watching the video, um, if you have more information about the Pathway program, I don't want a bunch of white knights just saying the Pathway program is perfect. Like, be honest with me. Like, just come come to the channel, leave a comment. And uh, I really appreciate the comments that are like, you know, like, this is actually what's happening with the Pathway program. Um, I can you know, see your concern, but they actually do help in this way, this way, and this way. Like the more information that you provide, the more value your comment actually has and people will seriously consider it. Um, go ahead, Greg. Oh, I was, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I'm, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not like trying to speak ill or even positive really when I talk about that. I'm just kind of trying to say that is my perception. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I will, I will, I will give you, less perception and more information once once i reach out again that sounds perfect and just for context i'm very critical i'm critical of all these programs and you guys have not given me a lot to be critical over so maybe i just had to like, get it all out with a pathway program well i'm i'm uh i really appreciate i mean i think you know it's i'm i'm appreciative i'm appreciative of what you are doing don um because i think a lot of these programs do need to be looked at with a lot of suspect um, I, as I said, you know, tech elevator seemed like the least suspect one. Um, and I, I feel like I got, you know, I feel like I mostly got my money's worth, my family's money's worth, <laughs> um, but I, I but really you're utilizing uh, it. That's what's important. Yeah. I feel yeah. like it was, I feel like it was worth utilizing and, and worth taking in the end. Um, but yeah, I, I appreciate that you are looking at groups with suspect um, because these people need to be grilled. There are a lot of very, very uh, sketchy programs that I looked at before choosing Tech Elevator. Uh, don't even need to get into those yeah. details, but I'm sure you know about some of them. <laughs> Just watch a few of my other videos. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, well, that's it. We're at the end of the podcast. So let's go ahead and jump right into our outros. Uh, Greg, if people want to reach out to you, where could they reach you? Yeah, so I'm I'm Greg Murphy, uh, and my LinkedIn is Greg Murphy or Greg Murphy five seven. My email is Greg Murphy oh at gmail.com as well. Um, you can also reach out to me. I am a freelance creative project director, um, creative project manager. So if you are a artist who is writing a book and you can't get that book done, if you're an artist who is you know, drawing some pictures and you're unsure about your sort of artistic direction and what sort of arc that you're trying to pursue, or if you're a musician or really any medium, mediums that I don't even do art in. I am a person who helps creatives finish things because I happen to finish things myself and I apply, you know, project management principles and do all this other stuff. And it is a fun, fun, fun passion of mine some people pay me. Sometimes I do it for free if I like your project enough. So um, feel free to reach out, you know, as, as well, um, just kind of as a, as a passionate uh, love thing on the side. Okay, sounds good. And yeah, and I am currently looking for work. I've got a couple of really good prospects going on right now. I'm deep, deep into reteaching myself JavaScript, so I don't look stupid in a tech interview this coming week. Um, but yeah, you know, I am looking for work. And if you feel like you might not hate working with me, I would love for someone to reach out. 
I'm sure people would love to work with you. And uh, <laughs> good luck with the interview. Thank you so much, man. Sure. How about you, Tim? Yeah, so uh, everybody can uh, reach out to me on my LinkedIn. Uh, I'm Tim Heckler. I uh, love hearing about opportunities or just general networking with people to be able to do cool things like appear on podcasts or whatever else. And uh, yeah, that's where you can find some more of that contact information there. That sounds really cool. Um, what, sorry, elaborate on podcast. Oh, just like that, uh, you know, through me having my LinkedIn, I was able to appear on this. You reached out to me. So it's just opportunities like that. Okay. I was thinking you had the email that had podcasts in it. I actually, th I, I was thinking like you yeah, had I a podcast. No, 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 no. I don't have my own podcast. It's just my uh, own domain. It's okay. Okay. Um, damn. I was going to listen to it. All right. But uh, <laughs> thanks for sharing. Really cool. I'm glad to have you on. How about you, Noel? Uh, yeah, you can get me on LinkedIn at Noel Rivera. Or my name is Noel Rivera on LinkedIn, so you can find me there. Um, I also am on Twitter and Instagram at Classica Noel, where I primarily do book and art related content. Um, I am a writer and an artist, and I am also an editor still on freelance. So I keep track of all that stuff on my LinkedIn as well as my software development uh, career. Okay, really cool. All right, well, you know, stick around for a couple minutes after the podcast, but, you know, thanks for watching. Let me know what you thought and let me know if you're considering Tech Elevator and, and what you thought of it, any future questions you have. Maybe people can answer them in the comments. And podcasts like this, um, all my episodes are pretty much, you know, paid for and supported through Patreon, or you can even just click the join button underneath the video if you're subscribed. Super helpful. You don't have to do it, but thank you for everyone that does support me. Um, Greg, Tim, Noel, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you.